Bonjour. Bienvenue. Good afternoon and welcome to this sub plenary fighting discrimination, taking action for equity regarding health. And I am going to be the facilitator this afternoon. And before we get started, I'd like to welcome you to Montreal and let you know that in Montreal, often people speak their own language in French, English or in Spanish and everyone understands everyone it's magical and today you've actually got interpretation so if that's not already the case please do look up uh, your translation which will be at the bottom of your screen and you need to choose the option French, English or Spanish and that's the language that you can use to follow our plenary. and I'm uh, Nadia Bastien myself. So now I'm going to give the floor to Madame Josefina Blanco, who is a member of the Executive Committee at of Montreal, and she was elected with Project Montréal in 2019, the Plateau Montréal Borough. During her first term, she worked extensively on social development, diversity and cultural issues. She served on the Public Safety Commission and worked on accountability on the fight against uh, racial and social profiling, and she contributed to launching the Latin American Heritage Month. And since 2021, she's a city councillor for the saint edouard district in the Rosemont La Petite Patrie and a member of the city's executive committee is responsible for diversity, social inclusion, homelessness, universal accessibility, the status of women, youth and seniors. So you have the floor, Madame Blanco. Thank you very much, uh, Madame N Nesrin and and also the Head of uh, Diversity and Inclusion, and Madam Hatamiko, who is Manager for the Data for Equity for the uh, City of uh, Toronto, and also the representative from the Commissioner of Social Affairs and the Promotion of Women of the uh, ECOWAS. So welcome to everyone this afternoon. We'd like to welcome you to Montreal, which is found on a millennial indigenous territory, which has been a place of meeting and diplomacy between indigenous peoples and the Treaty of Great Peace. And we'd like to thank the Ganyi Ganui uh, Nation for welcoming us to their unceded territory. So it's a real pleasure to welcome you to this subplenary, which is organised by the uh, Diversity and Social Inclusion Department of the City of Montreal within the framework of the 24th IUHP World Conference on Health Promotion, which is entitled uh, Fighting Against uh, Discrimination taking action for equity regarding health. We're going to look at major results uh, carried out by public health in different regions and different contexts, thanks to an intersectional approach. Uh, the fight against uh, discrimination is a, a major advantage when it comes to changing uh, social determinants. Health, of course, the Beijing Declaration from 1995 and its uh, gender action plan and reinforcing women's empowerment. And it underlines the importance of equipment at all levels of government to have inclusive development in societies free of discrimination, gender equality and fighting against discrimination are also key uh, objectives and key sustainable development uh, goals of the UN. Here in Montreal, we have made a commitment in the City of Montreal to fight against all forms of discrimination, in particular those which are based on your uh, ethnicity or your colour, your gender, your age, your uh, status as a woman, uh, language, uh, religion, sex, identity or gender expression or sexual orientation or handicaps and it also recognises the intersectional systemic forms of discrimination. In order to fight against discrimination, we have to actually push forward these initiatives that have been developed and the City of Montreal has created a platform to exchange good practices on social cohesion, inclusion and urban safety through the International uh, Observatory on Living Together tomorrow. And this initiative groups together 55 cities throughout the world and it's become a movement to promote an exchange of experiences and find common 
Objective. So I'd like to thank the representatives of ECOWAS and also of the City of Toronto for having accepted this invitation to come to this sub-plenary. And we are all drawing on the principle that we have to have an exchange of experiences in order to take up local, uh, regional and global challenges in particular those who have been exacerbated as a result of COVID. We have to fight against systemic discrimination on certain populations and also the social determinants of health, such as food insecurity, access to local services, housing, mobility, quality of life, amongst others. In order to take up these challenges, Montreal has a specific tool to make sure that no one is excluded. It's called Gender-Based Analysis uh, Plus with an intersectional lens. And the GBA uh, Plus helps us to fight against uh, discrimination so that we can uh, generate uh, inclusive urban living, taking account of those who are often marginalised, such as women, racialised people, LGBTQ+, Indigenous peoples, those who have a disability, the old and the young and GBA plus is really the heart of the plans of the City of Montreal for the next few years. It's part of our Montreal strategic uh, plan and also our solidarity, equity and inclusion plan as well as our living plan and the urban and mobility plan which we're developing. And one of the three guiding principles for the future mobility plan is health and well-being of the Montreal population and in fact the quality of urban living and vitality and resilience of the city has an impact on the health of the population so that means that our actions in terms of uh, urbanism and mobility have to be uh, founded on this desire to improve the health of the whole population and also to increase its well-being on a daily basis and take account of it, the accumulative effect of discrimination on these different population groups that are most often excluded. So in maintaining or pursuing these objectives, it's very good to get access to the uh, good practices from other places. So that is why it's very useful to have this type of dialogue space. And I'm sure that we'll be inspired by this sub plenary and now I give the uh, floor uh, to Nesrin Besain from the Regional Public Health uh, Directorate, who's going to facilitate this session. I'm sure she will have very relevant questions to put to the uh, panellists because she is in charge of a committee that is actually rolling out GBA Plus in her institution. Thank you very much for uh, getting so involved in the organisation of this sub plenary, and I look forward to hearing from all of you. Thank you very much, Madame Blanco, and thank you to the uh, Diversity and Inclusion uh, Department from the City of Montreal for inviting me to facilitate this. It's, a it's great to work with you, and I do indeed work in the Regional Public Health Directorate, uh, which uh, deals with uh, health, social inequalities, and also uh, community development. And we are trying to set up a project for the integration and implementation of GBA Plus, but I've got uh, several hats as the case with. Uh, many of you. I'm also involved in the Research Institute in Feminism at the University of Montreal and I'm also specialised in implementing intersectionality. So yes, I'm very much looking forward to hearing from you today and you'll see that we're going to have an hour and an hour and a half uh, together but that will be very interesting. We're going to have three experts with us from different municipalities and regions that are committed in uh, reducing systemic discrimination with innovative approaches. So we've got Mr. Ahmed Wuma and from the ECOWAS we Ms. Nadia Bastian and Mr. Ahmed Metzamenko from Toronto. So so briefly, just to give you an idea of what's going to happen, Montreal is going to share with us the results of a pilot project that has been implemented uh, dealing with GBA+, plus, a gender-based analysis, plus an intersectionality. So we're going to bear that in mind. So Montreal is going to tell us how they've actually implemented this and look at the potential 
impacts on social determinants of health. And then Toronto will talk about a process where they've adopted a strategy uh, for uh, socioeconomic data collection. There's been collaboration with Indigenous and Black and anti-racist groups and how that linked in with this initiative, Data for Equity, and what was actually revealed by this data collection that was gathered during the pandemic. And then finally, for ECOWAS, uh, European Community for the Western African States, we'll get an overview of the secondary effects of the pandemic on women's situations and we will also hear about a, a, a gender-based approach which reveals public health issues in the sub-region and will also show where the spread of the infection may have appeared but it seems on the face of it to have been relatively contained thanks to this gender-based approach. So with uh, the sub we're going to be uh, dealing with major policy issues based on intersectionality in different regions and in different contexts. We've got two municipalities, Montreal and Toronto, and then we're hearing from Western Africa, that other region in the world, and we'll be drawing on different practices, strategies, experiences, and a global solidarity because these are uh, key experiences so that we can act with solidarity and justice at a local and also at a global level. So before I present our panellists in more detail to tell you who's going to uh, be with us, we're going to actually turn to the audience because for the moment I cannot see you, but fortunately I see the panellists in front of me because otherwise I would feel that I'm speaking just to myself. So you will see that there's a chat box and you will be able to open up the section for questions and answers and I'd like to invite you to tell your panellists who you are. So I'd like to invite you to introduce yourselves and simply if you could just give your uh, title. Sometimes we've got several responsibilities but you can choose one to share with us today and also tell us from which part of the world you're listening in today where you're actually situated today for participating in this conference and we'll go through a different list because there's different categories. We've got executives, we've decision makers, we've got people who do research, uh, physicians, uh, so that we can better understand who is with us today. So I'd like to invite you, if you're a physician, for example, in public health or uh, in a clinic, if you're a physician, uh, please start now to write down your uh, title and the region from which you're participating in this conference today. So write that in the chat and that should appear. Now, I'm not quite sure where it's going to appear myself, but I'd be very interested to know who's actually with us. And I'd like to ask my colleague, uh, Cecilia, please, Cecilia, help me to find that information and see where it's going to appear, because we're going to get uh, the answer up here. Now, for two years now, we've been using these uh, tools, so we're not going to be intimidated. We'll just do what we have to do. So if you're a physician, please write your title and the region from which you're listening in. And then we'll have a second uh, series for those who are executive managers in the government or in the municipality or a health institute. If you're managers and decision makers in these institutes, please give your title and your region. And sorry, I'll just check that what I'm doing is actually working because I can't actually see anything appearing myself. Is it working, Cecilia, in the chat? Oh, there's a lag, apparently. So apparently there is a lag, but I hope that you are writing something down. I'm looking forward to read all of that, and I hope that the uh, lag, the time lag, will disappear. Now, where was I? Now, where are you all? What happened there? So now if you're a researcher in an institution or in a research institute, for example, or at a university, if you could please give your title now. Your title. And the place where you're situated. And if you're an advisor, an intervener, if you're an advisor for programs or for research, write that down.
Thank you very much for that. Now, I don't know exactly what that means, says the speaker. Very good. Perhaps I could ask technical support uh, from Stefan to help me out here. Could we have some feedback on what we should actually see on the screen at the moment? Okay, it's down here. You have to look at the window where it's marked a program and you should be able to see people's answers. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you for that. So without further ado, I'm going to now introduce our panellists and I'll start with uh, Mr. Ahmed Goma, who has jumped in to replace uh, Dr. Gany, who had a health issue and unfortunately was not able to be with us. So Mr. Buma, who is responsible for planning uh, research, uh, follow-up and evaluation in ECOWAS uh, dealing with uh, gender equality. And thank you very much for being with us today. We'll be giving the floor very soon because I'm going to give you the floor after I've just introduced the two other panellists. So now I'd also like, like to present uh, Ms. Gaone Machameko who is in charge of the City of Toronto's first ever Data for Equity strategy. And uh, Ms. Machameko has been pursuing this strategy to collect data in the city. Could you please change the slide? Ms. Gandhi Machameko, as I said, is heading up the first ever Data for Equity strategy. So she's from the City of Toronto and she has coordinated and headed up this first ever data for equity strategy in order to improve data collection within the diverse populations in the city. And prior to joining the public sector, she worked with reputable Canadian companies where she led strategic workforce initiatives and diversity and inclusion initiatives on uh, the workforce. So she really leads strategic workforce initiatives and strategies and she's done that for over 10 years, both in financial services, management consulting, technology, and she cares deeply about empowering people to pursue their potential and using data science to design organizations and cultures that embody the ideals of equity, inclusion and prosperity for all. And then our third panelist is Ms. Nadia Bastien, Director for the Diversity and Social Inclusion Department at the City of Montreal. And basically her uh, theme is the world is changing and I'm on the transition team. And she has 20 years of experience in education and management and half of this time as a manager. She has worked in the public and private sector and also with non-profits. And she has a degree in special needs education and social education and also has a, a, a further degree in management. She's just completed a master's in, in business administration and she's worked in developing an inclusive city's director of this diversity and social inclusion uh, service for the city of Montreal. Fettingen discrimination, inequalities and social exclusion. She's recognised for her leadership and bringing people together and she has been able to restructure organisations and mobilise teams around programmes and important projects to respond to emerging social issues. Now, I'm going to put some questions and then our panellists will answer. Each panellist will answer. Uh, with more or less information. They've got a great deal to say and of course I will be the one who will have to be the timekeeper because we need to stick to a programme and then afterwards we will have a question and answer session with the audience. You can put your questions and comments in the application as we go along through the Q&A section that's integrated onto the platform and we will also put questions to you, the audience. You'll need to answer that through a survey. It will be a Slido survey. So without further ado, we're going to put a first question to you. And the first question we're asking you about today is in terms of 
the integration of an intersectional gender-based approach. And we want to ask if you're already implementing an intersectional or a gender approach in your government or your municipality or in your institute. And you can answer yes, no, or we're thinking about this, or but why would we do this? So we'll leave you around 30 seconds to answer that question. So I will need the support from Cecilia to see if we can actually share the results up on the screen. Should I actually share this? Sorry, it's the first time that I am facilitating with this uh, type of application so we can see your answers. So yes, for the majority. You are already busy working with a gender or intersectional approach or GBA plus approach in your organisation. And earlier, I talked about the public health directed where we're just getting going with this. Personally, I would have answered that we're between yes and think and the answer. Think about this. We're trying to see how to tackle this question overall. So, without further. I do. We'll put the first question now to our panelists. And our first question that we're putting to you is to share with us one or two successes in terms of implementing this gender-based approach. And what have the outcomes or the successes that you've uh, come up across thanks to this approach? And we're going to start with Mr. Goma, I would like to invite you to take the floor to answer this first question on the results of implementing this gender approach within ECOWAS. Thank you, the European Community West African States. You have the floor, Mr. Goma. Thank you. Yeah, so um, I can speak in, in English? Yes, yes, you can speak in English. You, people okay. are going to hear um, the translation if necessary. Yes. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Madam Besa. Uh, I hope I pronounced your name very well. So I would like to begin by um, expressing the uh, apologies of the Commissioner, Dr. Sylvia Fatima Jai, for her inability to take part in this panel discussion um, due to ill health. Uh, so she really apologizes and she asked me because of the importance she attaches to uh, this panel discussion, she asked me to, to, to represent her. Um, and so, um, with respect to the, the first question, I, I would like to um, begin by saying that, you know, uh, ECOWAS, the economic community of West African states, uh, attaches so much importance to the issue of uh, gender equality and women's empowerment, and also with health. You know, and in trying to address these issues, um, the ECOWAS leadership have tried to address these issues from three or four levels. Um, the first level being the, the policy level, if you like, the strategy level. Um, and, and through, through that, um, Sorry, Mr. Guma, we, yes. we're having little uh, technical difficulties hearing you. So I'm, I'm being informed that they're going to cut your camera. So okay. the Wi-Fi is only for, your, uh, for what you're okay. saying. So we're going to hear you, but we won't see you anymore. Is that Fine. okay? That's okay. Yes. Thank you. Yeah, so I was saying, I was talking about the priority that it was leadership accords to issues of gender equality and women's empowerment and also health. And, and they, they try to address these issues at three levels. Such that's the policy level or the strategic level where, you know, uh, they have ensured, uh, you know, the enactment of policies, you know, policies beginning with the, the revised Treaty of ECOWAS of 1993, which makes adequate provision for, for addressing the issues gender challenges that confront the region and also the health challenges. And I'm limiting my discourse 
to gender and health because of the conference, because this conference is about health and the gender. And, and so the uh, so we have several instruments that have been I mean, enacted by our leaders to address these these two key areas. And, and the second um, level of commitment is at the institutional level. And, and with respect to this commitment, ECOWAS leaders have put in place um, the gender center, the gender uh, development center, which is based in Dakar, Senegal, uh, which is a specialized agency with the mandate to uh, ensure the gender mainstreaming in the ECOWAS integration policies and strategies, but also to work very closely with ECOWAS member states in dealing with the promotion of gender equality and women's empowerment. And the Gender Center has been doing this very, very actively. Um, if we come to the next phases of this conversation, uh, you know, I'll outline some of the key successes that the Gender Center has chopped. Yeah, by in, in trying to promote gender equality and women's empowerment in the ECOWAS region. In terms of health, at the institutional level, in terms of health, um, the ECOWAS leadership have put in place the West African Health Organization, WAHO, which is based in Boko Jilaso, in Burkina Faso, which is doing a marvelous job. Um, if you look at the way they responded to the Ebola crisis in the Zambia, and also the COVID crisis, uh, WAHO is doing a very marvelous job. That's at the institutional level. Then we have the operational level, you know, and that has to do with also the programs that we carry out to address the key issues that affect our people yeah, in terms of gender, in terms of health, uh, and the other areas of concern, you know. And as I said, I'm limiting myself to just uh, gender and health because of the, 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 the issues we're discussing, you know. And so um, the, 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 I think the, the formulation of these policies that have underscored the creation of these institutions, I think, is a very big success. Um, if you look at um, the uh, Africa and the experience that we have had in Africa, you know, and the fact that ECOWAS has been able to put in place a, a gender, a regional gender center to carry out research, advocacy, and develop programs to respond to the needs of gender equality and women's empowerment, I think that by itself is a big success. The establishment of uh, the West Africa Health Organization, you know, um, to cater for the health needs of the West African people, I think also it is a big success. Now we have carried out both institutions, have carried out several programs, you know, to address these issues. Now, if you want me to go into the programs, I can go into them, you know, just to highlight some of the great successes that these two institutions have made. If you look at the Gender Center, for instance, um, the Gender Center. Um, through the implementation of a strategic plan, you know, has provided support for national gender machineries, uh, the equals member states to develop gender policies um, and then to be able to harmonize their policies, you know, and create the framework for the effective implementation of these national gender uh, policies. At the time that, um, I have one minute left, at the time that the gender center was set up, you know, I mean, just a few member states had gender policies. You know, and so through the, inter the interaction of the gender center, you know, with the member states, we're able to have now all every ECOWAS member states has a gender policy and that is being rolled out, you know, um, and also the WAHO, the West African Health Organization, I mean, as I indicated, the, the kind of efforts that they put in uh, when during the Ebola crisis and the COVID crisis, you know, are very phenomenal. And I think these are successes that we can highlight you know, um, in ECO as, as part of efforts to uh, support, promote gender equality and women's empowerment, but also to ensure the health of the people. Thank you very much, Mr. Guma. Mr. Guma, thank you very much for your presentation. We're going You're to have welcome. the time later to come back with the programs and the more details on, on the project you've been <clears> leading. <throat> so um, I will now ask you, now I'm I'm facilitating in English. Je vais passer la parole maintenant. So, I'm going to give the floor to Ms. Nadia Bastien, who's going to talk to what's been happening in Montreal and how GBA Plus has been used as a lever for the social determinants of health. Thank you very much uh, and welcome to everyone. I'm very happy to be here and have the 
be able to exchange best practices with uh, colleagues in Toronto and West Africa. It's extraordinary. So we're going to talk about how we use GBA Plus in Montreal as a lever so that we can act more efficiently on social determinants of health, whether in terms of food insecurity or social exclusion or lifestyle or land use planning. Of course, that's an important aspect as well because it's a municipal competence and it's also a health determinant. So that means we can work even more on that. You've asked for specific examples and success stories. So I'm going to talk more specifically about the uh, complex, the aquatic centre in Rosemont. And this is an aquatic uh, complex where we drew on the fact that the gendered locker rooms, where there was a locker room just for women and another one just for men, was actually creating obstacles uh, for homoparental uh, families or for school groups, etc., to actually use these locker rooms. So the idea was to integrate uh, GBA Plus into all of the steps which allowed us to come up with these universal locker rooms. So how did we uh, do this? First of all, the project manager was uh, trained in terms of integration of GBA Plus, and we also went to consult with people. There were public consultations which allowed us to actually uh, meet uh, with people, for example, in the neighbourhood, the schools, and those who used the uh, sports complex to understand their needs and the obstacles that we needed to work on more. So that is how we came up with this solution that's been uh, developed to create universal locker rooms that are universally accessed and are non-gendered so that we could re-include everyone, particularly those who are non-binary. So the idea is that it really uh, responds needs and it facilitates uh, the support of someone who's from another gender, for example, a care person to help someone who is a senior of another sex or gender. Now they're going to have easier access without any obstacles. And I referred to school groups or day camps or uh, caregivers. And how do we do this? Well, in fact, there were rules that were set up as well to help with constructing these locker rooms a rule to say that nudity was going to be uh, banned in common spaces and there was a layer which would allow for more invisibility so people meant, felt uh, safer and also we wanted to ensure that the cabins were fully closed from top to bottom so that they would be more accessible and we looked at the size of the uh, locker room cabin so that a whole family could go inside one of the lockers. And what was the impact of all of this? Because that's what we're looking at today. It really reinforced access to sport and leisure for everyone because we have carried out a survey amongst the LGBTQ population. Just to give you an example, what they perceived was that 60% of the aquatic centres were not actually seen as safe for trans people, so it's major for a city to actually deal with that issue. Same thing when it comes to universal uh, access. It's not all sports centres that are laid out in an accessible way. So we wanted to think about this in terms of being universally accessible, which means that we can bring in everyone and not leave anyone behind, as has already been said by my colleague earlier. Then quickly, a second example in terms of our call for uh, projects because we give financial support to many community organisations on various subjects, whether it's uh, food uh, security or universal access or s school perseverance or leisure. And we thought that within these calls for project, when we're selecting projects for funding to support uh, organisations, that we should take the same GBA plus approach. Well, in fact, we want to make sure that we take account of GB Plus in the whole programme cycle. From the very beginning, when we create uh, tools for communities, we need to train them and support them through the whole process for developing their projects. And also in the back office, as we say, to work to incorporate the GBA 
plus when it comes to selection criteria for the projects and how we disseminate the calls for projects so that we can actually reach all of the community organisations and not just the usual ones who always send in their application to the City of Montreal. Same thing when it comes to the composition of the selection jury and uh, capacity building with community organisations. We did all of that to reinforce inclusion and make sure that our calls for projects actually reach vulnerable communities that they're meant to be serving. Thank you very much, Mr. Bastian. That's a very interesting presentation from both of you. And we also see that when we're talking about the populations that are most concerned, that's what we've just seen from Mr. Bastian. It's very important to have consultations with those who actually use the services and base our solutions on their concerns and needs. And also with the GBA Plus, the idea is that we start with issues that have been raised by a smaller part of the community, but in fact it has an impact on a, a far bigger group of people. When you were talking about the locker rooms, you were looking first of all the needs of trans people and non-binary people, but the changes that were made were also good for uh, families, for uh, caregivers, support people, for those who have disabilities or who are suffering from an illness. So it means that uh, we're uh, killing many birds with one stone, i.e. we're meeting far wider needs in responding to this need. And as I'm in the Public Health Directorate, we often deal with this major concern of data, and in particular, disaggregated data. And the City of Toronto has rolled out a fascinating project on this. So I'm going to give the floor to uh, Raoni Machameko to talk about this Data for Equity project. So over to you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nazmin. Hello, everyone, and thank you for the opportunity to be here to meet all of you virtually to share the work that the City of Toronto is leading with regards to the Data for Equity strategy and also our approaches specifically regarding uh, disaggregated data collection. So just by way of introduction, my name is Hane, my pronouns are she and her, and I have the pleasure of leading the City of Toronto's Data for Equity strategy and the team. In very simple terms, our mandate is to deliver the City of Toronto's commitment to collect social demographic data and use disaggregated data to make better decisions and to provide excellent public service that will ultimately improve the lives of Toronto's diverse population. Our work is quite important uh, to the mandate of the City of Toronto because we play a critical role in enabling our city divisions, our staff, our elected officials, and more broadly, the public to be able to use data to achieve one of the three broad uh, objectives that are listed on the screen. The first is really that it's social demographic data and specifically disaggregated data really helps us to understand what are the experiences, the barriers, and the outcomes of diverse residents in our city. So we recognize that some groups of Torontonians do face very serious systemic discrimination and barriers to various issues from income, housing, employment, education and services and some certain demographic groups do experience even worse outcomes as a result. So this collection of disaggregated data is really there to enable us to apply that intersectional lens that we were just discussing to better understand who is and who isn't accessing city programs, who is achieving what specific outcomes and where service barriers exist so that we can uh, be more proactive in our approaches as public servants to address these pertinent issues that our residents are facing. We also recognize that um, in terms of our city infrastructure, it's really important that we continue to collect and use disaggregated data to improve the way that we can systemically um, be coordinated in how we're able to respond to pertinent issues across our city. Ultimately, our goal is to be able to use the data that we're collecting to translate it into meaningful action and to intentionally design solutions, not 
not just as bureaucrats in our offices um, on our own, but certainly to co-create the solutions with the affected communities that we know are most impacted. And so as we think about how we're approaching this work from a service delivery or service planning perspective, it's really important that we're able to leverage this data to meet the needs of those communities and to be able to serve our communities more equitably um, throughout. And lastly, the importance of using this data is really there to ensure that we're able to monitor and measure any of the interventions and actions that we put in place, um, moving the dial and making any meaningful impact towards a more equitable city and society in general. So, um, in terms of generally how we work, we typically work with various city divisions and staff and we provide some advice on how they can begin to collect and use this data in a meaningful way based uh, to assess equity impact based on who people are, where people live, and what kind of resources folks have in terms of their income, education, and employment levels. These are just high-level examples of the types of social demographic data that we work with in our data research. And so at this time, I just want to highlight one of the examples of a really great use case that we have been working on uh, from a, a health equity and health uh, perspective with our Toronto Public Health Division. Essentially, um, Toronto Public Health has had tremendous experience in collecting and analyzing social demographic data uh, on various health issues, but more recently specifically related to the COVID-19 cases and vaccination. And this is a really great use case and a timely illustration of how this aggregated data that was collected could be used to identify and rapidly respond to emerging inequities in our city. So we've been uh, collecting various types of um, social demographic data, again, going back to that point about applying the intersectional lens in our work to see where the barriers may be from a health equity perspective. And the data that we've collected so far had indicated that you know, there were higher rates of COVID among um, low-income people, many racialized groups, and that there were a high concentration of cases in some specific um, Toronto neighborhoods. So this is one tangible example of how the data helped us understand the situation of COVID in our city. But more broadly, we were able to uh, use this data to inform a couple of different strategies that the city employed to respond to the emerging uh, COVID case um, that we were dealing with. More specifically, um, we leveraged this data, you know, with the mindset of understanding the specific communities that were impacted, and we decided to engage with the leaders from those communities that were overrepresented in COVID-19 infection to really work with them to come up with solutions that were locally responsive and more responsive to the needs of the various folks on, on, on the ground and to ensure that they were not left behind in the conversation about the city's response. Oftentimes, communities can be an afterthought in this kind of work. So we were very intentional in engaging with the various um, relevant communities. We also used this data to identify neighborhood hotspots, recommended high-risk areas where we could set up mobile and pop-up testing and vaccination sites and to also um, identify priority schools that needed smaller class sizes. We also use this data to determine our funding model for community agencies, vaccine engagement teams, and resident ambassadors to set them up for success and to ensure that as they were going out into the communities, they were well resourced and prepared to work with the various uh, residents and address the critical issues that were on the ground. We also use the data to set up Toronto's Voluntary Isolation Center, and more broadly, uh, the data informed our approach and advocacy for paid sick leave and the improvement to working condition. Overall, this experience has shown us the importance of understanding who is most impacted by an issue and how this kind of disaggregated 
information can be used to respond to inequities in our city. It also demonstrated the importance of a centralized support system, having resources and tools to enable implementation. I'd be happy to share more about what we've learned in our journey to date uh, later on in the presentation. Yeah, I already have questions for you, Madame <laughs> Zemenko. So we're going to keep on uh, now with Madame Nadia Bastien, qui va nous parler cette fois-ci de... And this time, she's going to talk about the implementation taking off in Montreal with a GBA+. Plus. And there's going to be very uh, similar examples to what we've just heard about. The question is the importance of the data, and data really is at the heart of the success of GBA+. Plus. And I'm going to give you some specific examples. First of all, there was an initiative in the uh, culture service, which pursues a mural art project, and they were wondering about the groups that they were actually reaching with this program. The idea was to verify the uh, hypothesis that they had the impression they always collaborated with the same pool of artists, the same people. So what they actually set up was a form based on self-declaration so that uh, the artists who were submitting uh, their forms that they could actually uh, make a self-declaration so that we could have a um, gendered breakdown of the artists that we're reaching and see the artists that we weren't actually reaching as a city. And then with the analysis of these data, we were able to adjust our programs to make sure that we could reach more women, racialized uh, people and people who live in neighborhoods that don't tend to submit uh, projects with this call for projects. So that was quite a striking example. And then there was the question of uh, procurement, where once again we wanted to see whether the suppliers dealing with the city were often the same. So we wanted to see whether there were some blind spots in terms of the suppliers that were having access to the funds of the city. So together with the Diversity and Social Inclusion Service, the procurement service actually drew up a way of collecting data so that we could have disaggregated gender data and better understand whether the uh, suppliers were made up by more women, more racialized people or not, and to be able to act at the right uh, place uh, with the right people to have a more diversified pool. So that's why it's important to have a disaggregated data so you can be aware of the targets and the audiences we are serving and better identify those that we are potentially serving. And then in terms of uh, diversity and the social inclusion uh, uh, service, uh, we're giving you some examples here. And first of all, there's the uh, Sondage Eco Barometer, the Eco Barometer survey, which was to allow us to better understand the needs of immigrant populations, in particular newcomers in Montreal. So we wanted to know what could be certain obstacles or put a break on their inclusion. And we wanted to hear from them directly. So the surveys allowed us to reach over a thousand people out in the field and we cho chose uh, districts where they were actually living. So we were able to have a, a disaggregated a gender broken down data and also the different types of discriminations that, that they were uh, undergoing because of their migratory trajectory because these can be different and they can uh, experience different obstacles. So with these uh, disaggregated data, we could better understand these phenomena that people were experiencing in the city of Montreal. And then last but not least, we set up a unit and that uh, refers to the example shared by our colleague in Toronto. There was the creation of a unit dedicated to social development data analysis, uh, the, which has just been uh, set up and it has a specific mission to acquire, to demystify, popularize value and share uh, social data 
because having access to these data is not just for the diversity service, but it's for the city of Montreal as a whole. And thanks to these data, we can better understand the issues at stake for our population and better serve them and have the right interventions to serve them and make it easier also to take decisions so that we can act where the needs are actually at. Merci, Madame Bastien. Thank you very much. Madame Bastien, for sticking to your timetable. And I'm going to give the floor to Mr. Gouma, who's going to talk about the gender based approach to data within the ECOWAS. So you have the floor now, Mr. Gouma. Please, over to you. Hey, Madame. Thank you very much. Um, uh, we, with respect to sex disaggregated data, um, that has been our main focus um, because of the peculiarity of our, our region, um, uh, because of historical factors and also social cultural factors. Um, you know, women are very much disadvantaged, not only women and also other vulnerable groups are very much disadvantaged. And so in carrying out research, we need to base our research on this uh, approach of sex segregation to be able to identify the differential impacts uh, of policies, uh, social, economic, and political policies, the differential impacts on the population, because invariably, um, these policies and conditions affect women and men differently. Um, in, in our sub-region, in ECOWAS region, there's a high level of poverty. Um, and so if you have segregated data, you're able to know the skew where, where which segment of the population is affected more by poverty. And through that, we have been able to establish that there's a kind of, there's a growing feminization of poverty in the Equus region. And so um, this informs policy, this, you know, this kind of data that we have informs policy, enables uh, policymakers to be able to adapt policies that respond, you know, to the needs uh, because women are more, affected by poverty than men you know in in terms of education uh, our our research has indicated uh, that when it comes to enrollment and retention in education um, there, there's there are differences between boys and girls in most of the countries in West Africa so you have you know more boys being enrolled uh, than girls because of certain factors including uh, child marriage. Child marriage is a very important, it's a very big issue in our part of the region. And because of that, most girls are not able to go to school. Uh, even where girls even go to school, you know, at some point, they are withdrawn from school to be able to give out on marriage. You know, and that is, that is, that, that, uh, that phenomenon, you know, is, is portrayed uh, through uh, sector segregated data that we collect. And so education, in, in terms of education, you know, sex segregated data has been able, has given us much information. And so in, de in developing policies, our policymakers are being guided, you know, by some of these findings, you know, um, on the differential impacts of these conditions and policies on men and women and boys and girls. In terms of health, health is another area where um, sex segregated data has contributed tremendously, um, particularly with respect to sexual and reproductive health rights. You know, um, there also we find that women are more disadvantaged um, when it comes to childbirth, you know, and, and so, um, it, you know, our research, particularly research carried out by the West Africa Health Organization, you know, have shown um, the kind of emphasis that policy needs to make to be able to cater for the, the, the differential impacts that these policies have and these conditions in our sub-region for men and women. The participation also in decision making, that's at the political level, um, we have a very serious situation in West Africa where um, averagely the population, we have about 52% of the population in this part of the world is female and about 48 is male. And yet, uh, if you look at the, um, the, the national assemblies, cumulatively, women make about just about 20% of the membership of national assemblies. At the executive level, you know, we don't have even one single president, you know, in, in the sub-region, you know, all presidents are men. And if you look at the, the executive, the ministerial positions, 
the, the percentage of women is very, very low. And so here also, you know, set disaggregated data is able to point out the weaknesses that we have in our structures and what needs to be done. You know, um, peace and security is also another area where uh, set disaggregated data has, uh, I mean, helped tremendously, you know, to be able to come up with the challenges that we face and what needs to be done. Uh, even in the COVID-19 uh, uh, pandemic, you know, the research that was carried out gave out so much information about the differential impact of the of the pandemic on men and women, uh, particularly in terms of uh, you know sexual and gender based violence, in terms of education, how it affected the education of girls, uh, in terms of uh, poverty, the perpetuation of poverty, you know. So these are all uh, instances, you know, where we have used segregated data, you know, to understand the situation in the, in, the, in the social, economic, and political situation in the sub region, and also to be able to inform policy because it provides evidence based information that can be used to influence policy. And, um, you know, I think I'm told that my time is up. <laughs> you know, so, so um, basically, this is, this is um, what we have tried to do, uh, you know. In, in the sub region using sec disaggregated data, you know, to be able to unearth the differential impacts that policy have on people and also what needs to be done by our intervention to address the differential needs of, of men and women. Thank you. Merci à vous, Monsieur Guma. Thank you very much, Mr. Guma. So we see the importance of having disaggregated uh, data and how it helps us to understand what's happening so that we can actually properly have health surveillance of the population and act and develop policies and programs that will be more inclusive and take account of uh, social inequalities. And how are we going to get these data? That's a key question. We've seen the uh, large-scale surveys, uh, the population surveys, and also self-declaration forms were cited, and then the applications for grants and funding. I think we'll be able to come back to this question of how, because that really is a key issue when it comes to disaggregated data. So now we're going to ask the panelists to talk about your most effective strategy and how you were able to develop things and set things up with GBA Plus in your municipality and in your region. And we'll uh, kick off with Mrs. Matt Chamico, please, for Toronto. Thank you so much, Maxine. I... Okay, I can see the slide now. Thank you. I, I, I'll just some of the lessons that the city of Toronto has learned in implementing the data facility strategy. And these lessons have really been a catalyst in our growth journey to date. Um, I'd say from the outset that data equity really is fundamentally about applying equity lens in an integrated way into existing systems and processes with clearly articulated equity priorities and a commitment, a firm commitment to making policy and program changes that will ultimately change people's lives. I think at the end of the day, that's really what we're trying to do here. And to apply this equity lens successfully, um, we find it helpful to have resources and capacity are built into um, our existing city systems and processes, um, especially in various areas related to program planning, monitoring, evaluation, implementation. On the data side, having um, the right level of research uh, design, data analysis, collection, and data entry tools and processes, along with the relevant um, systems for privacy ethical requirements in our IT systems. And on the other side, we've also seen the importance of ensuring that you know, communication about and reporting on program activities, including data collection itself, is in included in this process. And that's the findings from the data um, analysis and the actions that are taken in response to um, 
the work that we're doing. I shared that with the community, that in time the community do feel that they're not part of this work or that we collect data but we don't show back what we're doing with them. So this has been one of the fundamental pieces that uh, we've taken away from this work from the onset in terms of our systems and processes. I'll also emphasize the importance of staff education, training and capacity building. It is quite critical to success. And the two very common myths about social demographic data collection, you know, some staff automatically assume that clients are not willing to share information about themselves or that, you know, asking clients personal questions would make them uncomfortable, even worse that the questions that we ask would offend them. But, you know, historical research that we've done in, 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 back in 2013 with the Toronto Public Health and along with some hospitals in Toronto that work together on a project called We Ask Because We Care, um, it, it really was testing the collection of these types of disaggregated social demographic questions. And we looked at the client acceptance um, and found that generally clients have been receptive to answering social demographic questions. So this kind of resistance that sometimes we have as an assumption is simply unfounded. And although yes, there are areas where, for example, with disclosing income related information, clients might generally be uncomfortable with that information. I would say that for the very most part, um, one significant finding we see is that client comfort is social demographic data is heavily influenced by the staff comfort level. So that is why training is really important because when as our city staff are comfortable and they feel confident and, and with the ability to communicate the purpose of data collection, then we're able to really have a really successful um, outcome with data collection and most specifically with regards to um, the quality of data that we're able to collect. So this is really critical in the work that we're doing. And I'd also share that, you know, in order to ensure that this work um, is transparent, accountable, and certainly responsive to the needs of the community, community engagement advice and Structured governance models are quite critical component in this work. For example, the, the pilot that I shared about Toronto Public Health it was just developed because of critical community relationships and partnerships that were built with various um, neighborhoods and, and leaders as a way of really informing how the city of Toronto could implement our COVID response and also provide guidance on how data could or should be um, collected and used and shared back with the community with the focus on ensuring that it's really data that's used to benefit the affected as service users and communities. So this is really important, the centering of the voices and lived experience of people who are most at um, greater risk of marginalization or discrimination in our pandemic response. Um, so that they also have a say in the decision-making process from the inception all the way through to the ending of the pro pro projects that we undertake. We also found it, um, instrumental to have in-house expertise for statistical and data analytics. Our data staff con conduct um, ongoing data analysis and reporting and meaningfully use data so that it's possible to really understand who's accessing city services, who's achieving what our clients, who's encountering service barriers. And this has really enabled us to be able to identify priorities and respond quickly to the emerging needs of targeted populations based on these types of uh, evidence-informed findings that we see. And I also recognize that, you know, for a lot of us who may be early in our journey during this work, you know, implementing sustainable change is quite challenging, let's face it, it is. Um, it does require um, champions among elected officials, bureaucratic leadership, uh, staff and community support, I can't emphasize that enough, as well as the substantial investment in resources will best change management and ongoing monitoring to ensure that we have the necessary support to make the, the right types of pivots and we're agile in our approach and not just static in the way that we look at data. And so if you know this kind of uh, infrastructure is not put in place, it does make it more challenging to have sustainable outcomes in how 
we can continue to do this work. So I, I really just want to emphasize that point and ensure and, and that, you know, at the end of the day, if the data that we're collecting is not being used, and people don't see the value in collecting it, it really impacts our ability to make impact in a way that is really meaningful. So as most of us are public servants, I think it's quite critical that we always reflect on that, that you know, the data that we're collecting ultimately should be used to increase the lives of our community. Thank you, Harmony. Over to you, Nathan. Merci beaucoup. Thank you. We'll continue with uh, Ms. Bastien, who's going to talk about these most effective strategies and what's happened in the city of Montreal. Well, there's lots of facts that I mentioned. There's lots of parallels also with what we've just heard from Toronto. There is this ambition within the city to really roll out uh, GBA+. Plus. So when I heard about the impact of these changes and the challenges. I think that's all very relevant, not just in Toronto, but also in Montreal, because it was a real change in our ways of doing things and in our practices. And one of the first keys for success was to draw on experts and to draw up a partnership with Relais Femmes, who really helped us to develop tools, and in particular with training, and to accompany us in our processes. Of course, we had this intention, this plan to become more autonomous in how we would apply GBA plus over time, and we wanted to do this in a cross-cutting way. So how did we approach this? Well, we had a bi-directional strategy up and down. At the same time, it's hard to do this virtually, but with this bi-directional strategy, we started with the, the bottom-up approach because, as I've said, it's important to have equipped, trained and accompanied uh, the staff, the city employees who have to implement this project and actually intervene at a municipal level. So there's over 900 city employees who have taken this basic introductory training on GBA+. Plus and there are services that were accompanied in implementing GBA+, Plus with their specific uh, projects. And within each of the units, we also trained agents who become ambassadors within their unit for GBA+, Plus to pass on the good news, so to speak, and uh, to preach the good news of GBA+, Plus to other employees. And in order to keep this community of practice uh, alive of these trained up people and these agents, we use the tools that are already available. Uh, we've set up a community of practice with monthly meetings so that we can have discussions and further have capacity building between the different services and share our knowledge. There's a chat that we've set up. We've given ourselves various tools to facilitate this exchange of practices between the different city employees. So that was our bottom-up approach to ensure that people out there in the field who are doing everything for the municipality should be made aware themselves and equipped to implement GBA+. If I'm talking about bottom up, we also need to have top down, and other speakers have already mentioned this. Namely, it's important to have political will from senior and top management so they really commit to GBA plus so that that joins the impact of the training that was carried out bottom up. So we've seen this, for example, in Montreal, where we've got a strategic plan 2020 to 2030 that expresses our priorities and our intentions. And we've got big framework documents that actually refer to this GBA plus perspective, saying it is the method, the uh, approach that we're going to pursue and give value to in the city of Montreal. So it really sets out the guidelines. Also, when it comes to big investments and d decisions that have been taken, particularly when we're talking about infrastructure and real estate, uh, once again, we have this GBA plus lens to make sure that with all of our big decisions that we take, we actually bear in mind the integration of GBA plus. So I said we do bottom up and top down. 
and of course the challenge is what happens in the middle to see how this bidirectional strategy actually gets implemented by the intermediate uh, uh, managers, the middle management, because they're really the ones who are responsible for operationalizing and rolling out many of these uh, city-wide strategies, and also they're the ones who allocate uh, resources. So as well as the bottom-up and the top-down approach, it's also to work in the middle at this stage in the process to ensure that we get buy-in from the middle management. They need to understand GB plus and they also need to adhere to it and be open to being influenced and accompanied in this GBA plus process so that we can see these changes at all of the different planning stages for projects and all of the decision making uh, stages. This should percolate through all of the different layers of our big organisation so that we all put on our GBA plus glasses and use this approach across the board. Thank you very much, Nadia. And I'm going to give the floor to Mr. Guma right away. Over to you, sir, to talk about your most effective strategies with your gender approach. So um, let me just, I just limit my intervention to, to gender. Um, you know, so our main objective is to promote gender equality and women's empowerment. Um, and we have quite, we have adopted quite a number of strategies, you know, um, to, to be able to do that. Um, you know, through um, ensuring that the member states, the gender machineries in the member states have all what it takes to be able to uh, ensure gender mainstreaming. Gender mainstreaming has been one of our main tools for promoting gender equality and women's empowerment, you know, uh, and we've, we've used that very effectively in, in member states. Um, we've also um, put in place uh, or putting in place a, a monitoring evaluation, reporting, and database system on uh, on gender development in the West region um, through carrying out a baseline study, you know, to be able to understand what is going on in terms of gender development, and then carry, putting in place this system for continuously monitoring and evaluating um, the, you know, the what is going on in the member states in terms of gender, you know, reporting on those things, and been able to create a framework for having real-time data, you know, on gender equality issues uh, in the sub-region. One, one other priority that we, we are think we're working on is to put in place a gender barometer tool, you know, that will test the pulse of uh, gender in the sub-region. We don't have this kind of tool in the sub-region, in the ECOWAS region. So we're putting in place this gender barometer tool uh, to be able to enable us, you know, uh, collect data, uh, analyze, and then the report on the involvement of gender uh, uh, and development in the sub region based on the 12 uh, you know, areas identified by, uh, with the, in the Beijing Platform for Action and Declaration you know, paradigms. So these are some of the key strategies that uh, we are carrying out. We also uh, are using networking as a tool you know, for improving upon gender equality and women's empowerment in the Equus region. Uh, we've set up two, two networks, two regional networks, one on peace and security and the other on leadership, female leadership, you know, and through this networking, you know, we think that uh, as a way of getting women to work together, building synergy in dealing with the issue of gender equality and women's empowerment, I think that is a very powerful tool. Um, we've also, uh, in, the term, in, the, in the area of um, a, um, you know, trying to promote gender equality and women's empowerment, we've, we've diffused a gender report. We had a, an annual gender report, you know, uh, that provided information to all stakeholders about how gender was, or, I mean, about the conditions of gender uh, in the Equus region. We've not been able to, you know, sustain this, but I think that initially it was a very important strategy, you know, in trying to inform all our stakeholders both within the Equus region and outside, about the state of gender uh, in the region, you know, and this helped very much uh, to, you know, institute policy measures by leaders and also by our partners, you know, in promoting gender equality in the sub-region. So basically, these are some of the strategies, the key strategies that we have used. Uh, Wahoo also have, you know, the, the West Africa Health Organization have also developed a, a gender strategy, gender strategy plan, you know, which has 
enabled the West African Health Organization to integrate gender, you know, into their work. You know, uh, so these are some of the key strategies that we have tried to use to promote gender equality and women's empowerment uh, in the ECOWAS region. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Merci beaucoup. Thank you. Those were very rich presentations as to how we should proceed and the most effective strategy. So I'll come back to Ms. Besaya, who talked about bi-directional strategies and that needs to be political will and political leadership to implement this. So it needs to be top down and bottom up. And then this question of training of employees and managers and senior managers, that's very important. You need to have champions for this strategy. In the city of Montreal, you talked about setting up a community of practice to support all of this. And then you need to draw in expertise on the use of GBA plus for sport and training and also for the analysis of all of this, how to tackle it. And there's also the question of the model of governance that has been shared to find ways through governance of integrating the voices of those who are primarily concerned. Should it be through consultations or how are we going to actually integrate these voices? It's very important to explore that facet as well. Now we plan for a period of questions and answers. There's no questions in the chat, but I've got some questions. Don't know if we'll have time to deal with all this, but I would like to put a question to you. And in particular to the representative from Toronto and the city of Montreal. In terms of data, in Montreal we have access to green or ecological data. And with COVID, we've been able to use this type of ecological data to see the neighbourhoods that were most impacted by COVID. So which difference does this make if we use ecological data rather than disaggregated data? What's the added value of using ecological uh, data? And I don't know who would like to jump in. It's a big question. Yes, it's a big question. I don't know if I'll be able to answer this, but we have to use both, I think, as we've seen in the example with the disaggregated data. It's important to have a more granular reading of the population's needs and ideally it's good to be able to accumulate all these different layers of data to ensure that they're all fed into the decision-making process because when we talk about data, we talk about access to data, but it needs to be updated frequently to ensure that we always have access to the right information and be able to make the necessary adjustments to our policies and action plans and our uh, interventions so that we can adjust to all of this. And I think that COVID has been an extraordinary example to show how there were these new emerging needs that we could never have imagined or certain needs that were exacerbated because of COVID and without data and various uh, colleagues have mentioned notable examples without data and without being able to have access to updated data would actually restrain our capacity to intervene and to intervene with the right people at the right time in the right place. Read the speakers on mute. It's about, I was asking about data and what difference it makes to use uh, the disaggregated data as compared to ecological data. So uh, I'm asking this question because, uh, partly because in Montreal, uh, as public health direction, what we have access to our ecological data and uh, we're pushing towards having uh, disaggregated data. But uh, I wanted to have you, your help into uh, having more arguments, more uh, reasons uh, why it's a plus value to use those. Um, the added value. Madame Samiko. 
Ms. Machameko for Toronto, please. Hi, Ms. Queen. Um, I'd like to confirm the question again. Could you kindly please repeat? Yes, uh, I was talking about, uh, uh, like I can see in your presentation, when you were talking about uh, what you've been able to do with the, the data equity project, uh, for example, when you say uh, you have uh, engagement with leaders from communities overrepresented in COVID-19 COVID infection, that's the part where uh, spotting where are those communities we can do it with ecological data, right? So this is something we've been able to do in Montreal too. Uh, spot the neighborhoods where we had uh, we had to put more efforts to reach out people because more people were impacted by COVID-19. But now I'm looking at other things, like you said, something like the advocacy for paid sick leave and improvements to working conditions. And this is something I think where we need disaggregated data is to be able to spot those people who need sick leave and don't have them. What kind of employment and um, what kind of uh, jobs those people are doing, where are they working? And um, so I was asking, can you give me more, uh, more um, reasons to use those disaggregated data instead of just ecological data? Absolutely. So the various um, application of disaggregated data that we could look at both from a qualitative perspective, which is informed by community uh, perspective, and also from a, a, a quantitative perspective, which is really something that we focused a lot on. In terms of the public health um, example that I was sharing, um, with regards to the COVID case data that we collected, we were also looking specifically at understanding um, the COVID cases and hospitalization rates based on the neighborhoods, the race, the income of, of the folks that in this specific um, neighborhoods across the city of Toronto. And this kind of data has really been instrumental in helping us understand what we actually happening on the ground, right? In terms of um, seeing that, you know, in, in certain low income neighborhoods or racialized um, groups, there were higher concentration of cases um, of, of COVID case 19. But beyond that, we have taken it a step further uh, in partnership with uh, the Ryerson University in Toronto, or, well, it's formerly known as Ryerson University, but now it's called Toronto Metropolitan University, to undertake a research project uh, further to investigate how the social determinant of health has really affected COVID-19. And we collected um, data from over 700 people, um, looking at various data points, really from a quantitative perspective, um, based on race, ethnicity, um, employment occupation, income, housing, disability, chronic condition, sexual orientation and gender identity and access to testing to really take a broader intersectional lens at how social uh, determinants influence COVID-19 infection and this report will soon be released by our public health unit um, in the spring of this year. Merci beaucoup, madame. Thank you very much, Ms. Machameko. Would you like to add uh, something, Mr. Goma, or a different perspective? It has been said about ecological data. Is it okay? Okay. Thank you very much. Well, you know, our experience is different from the experience you have. Um, in that part of the world, you know, in the Montreal region. Um, you know, we um, deal with gender issues, um, you know, and the data that we collect is, you know, and as I indicated, we always emphasize on collecting sex segregated data, you know, just to look at the differentials, the differential impacts, you know, um, and, and what that can do in terms of policy to address the needs, you know. So at that level, you know, we are very comfortable with that. Now, when it comes to ecological data, probably you might, you might have to maybe throw more light on what exactly you mean by ecological data. Is it in ecological data in terms of the physical, you know, environment or ecological in terms of what? I mean, then I will be able to answer very, very clearly. Yeah. 
Okay, maybe it's very located and my question is because in my job, I'm asking this question. So maybe it's very specific to Montreal or, uh, but what I was, uh, what I want to say by ecological data is the fact that we don't have data as about um, like each person, what was their different, uh, is it, what was their different identities or aspects of their identities? People who got COVID, for example, the kind of data we have is, okay, in this neighborhood, we know that 45% of people got uh, COVID in between those two dates, but we don't know who exactly, but we know that in the neighborhood, there's a high rate, for example, of immigrants. So we might project that, oh, okay, maybe people uh, from immigration have been more impacted, but we don't have exactly uh, like a survey uh, going to each person and knowing what are the main aspects of their identity uh, or the, the uh, inequalities they, they go through. So this is the difference I was uh, underlining when I wanted to know more about how disaggregated data bring um, uh, pre-value, bring, bring more uh, capacities to act and to understand the situation, the context of social inequalities. Y yes, okay. So, I mean, you know, the the, the, we normally we carry out surveys just based on need, you know, and and normally we, the research design that we carry that we that we we adopt, you know, uh, depends on the kind of uh, information that we want to generate, you know, and so uh, our our interventions mostly are always limited to, you know, the um, just gender, uh, you know, the gender the differentials. Um, in terms of the the very key factors that affect the people, like as, as the poverty, like education, like health, you know, like uh, in terms of participation, uh, in decision making, you know. So we don't normally extend our you know our research to to ecological issues, you know. Uh, maybe it's something that we need to begin to examine uh, because of the. The, the the environment in which we find ourselves and the priority that we attach to the kind of information we want to generate when we carry out research, you know. But the way you have uh, explained ecological uh, understanding, it, but it, it's not factored. It's not one of the things that we factor, you know, in our surveys when we are carrying our certificate data. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, everyone, for your presentations. Uh, merci beaucoup de Thank you very much for all of the information that you've shared with us and all of these different perspectives on strategies to be implemented. And we can take away that we want to talk about figures and there needs to be a political will, but there's also work to be done on the field, boots on the ground. And I think that a big challenge with GBA Plus is that uh, organizations are very busy, things move uh, rapidly, it's the way in which we work and also because of the situation that we're all going through. So there's a great deal to be done and GBA plus means that we need to put all of this on hold and change our organizational culture so that we can put this on uh, hold. I was afraid that we were going to be a, a cut off all of a sudden. I just wanted to finish my sentence. We need to take time out to actually set up GBA+. So thank you very much to everyone. Thank you to the panellists. Thank you, Ms. Bastien, Mr. Machameko, and Mr. Guma, and Ms. Uh, Blanco, who is there. And thank you also to the Diversity and uh, Social Inclusion Service for this discussion. Goodbye. Thank you.